Good evening, everyone. My name is Wendy Gillis, and I'm the Interim Executive Director here at Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. Thank you so much for joining us for our first opening of 2024, which we are so proud to say is this museum's 30th anniversary year. I think that deserves a round of applause. We have a lot of great activities and events lined up all year long to celebrate this milestone anniversary, including special openings like this evening's. Um, we have a series of artist dinners planned this year with renowned chefs. We have brand new merchandise in our fabulous gift shop, including, and I have a prop here, these really fabulous glow-in-the-dark Kemper Museum sweatshirts. <laughs> so please go get one. Um, we have a photo booth, a new photo booth this year that's over there right outside the gift shop so you can capture your memories of your experiences here and it's open tonight so I encourage you to give it a try. And finally, uh, we have a 30th anniversary special membership deal. So for people who become members for the first time this year, it's only $30. And the best part about that is that you help support free programs, free attendance, free parking um, for this museum. So um, if you're not a member, I hope you become one this evening. Um, tonight, we are here to celebrate artist Hangama Amiri. This is Hangama's first solo traveling exhibition. And supporting artists, especially emerging artists who are at critical junctures in their career, is one of the hallmarks of Kemper Museum. And we are so proud to sponsor and host this first for Hangama. There are a lot of people and organizations um, that help make this exhibition possible. I'd like to first acknowledge the Kemper Family Foundations for their ongoing support, as well as all of our museum members. I'd also like to thank our institutional partners for this exhibition, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum and Amy Smith Stewart, who is the chief curator there. Thank you to our 30th anniversary luminaries, the McDonald Foundation and Joanne and William Sullivan. And to our premier benefactors, Kana Partners Fund and Emily and Todd Vaught in memory of Mary and Robert Sweat. A special thank you to our sustaining sponsors, Robert and Dr. Phyllis Bernstein Family Foundation Fund of the Jewish Community Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Kirk Foundation, Judy O. Kirk Charitable Fund, Michael and Linda Lyon, J.B. Reynolds Foundation, and the Soslin Foundation. We're also grateful for the galleries who lent the artist's work T293 in Rome, and Cooper Cole in Toronto. And to our community partners, Maria Dotsada Goodbreak, Executive Director of Global FC, and Halima Wahaj, who's a graduate student at the University of Kansas. And last but not least, a huge thank you for all the Kemper Museum staff who worked tirelessly, not just for this evening, but for this entire exhibition. Your teamwork is truly inspiring. And so now, yeah. So now I'm going to turn this to assistant curator Krista Alba, who organized this show, and she's going to tell you more about it and also introduce our artists. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that introduction, Wendy, and thank you all for joining us here tonight. Um, so as Wendy mentioned, my name is Krista Alba, and I'm the assistant curator at Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, it's my utmost pleasure to introduce you all to artist Hangama Amiri and curator Amy Smith-Stewart, the most dynamic duo for a conversation about the making of Hangama Amiri, A Homage to Home, which debuted at the, uh, the Altridge Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut last year in February of 2023 and has since traveled here to Kansas City where it will be on view until August 25th, 2024. Hangama Amiri was raised in Kabul, Afghanistan until she was seven years old. She and her family fled when the Taliban rose to power in 1996 and they subsequently took refuge in neighboring countries of Pakistan and Tajikistan before immigrating to Canada in 2005. The artist now lives and works in New Haven, Connecticut and exhibits internationally. Amiri's practice spans painting, printmaking, and drawing while incorporating textiles to examine notions of home as well as how gender, social norms, and larger geopolitical conflict impact the daily lives of women in Afghanistan and the Afghan diaspora. The works on view in A Homage to Home include textile works composed of hundreds of pieces of cut and sewn fabric which Amiri laboriously collages by using an applique technique. The resulting images feature figures, landscapes, advertisements, and goods inspired by the artist's personal archive, memory, and imagination. 
Through the creation of two-dimensional scenes, soft sculptures, and neon signs, Amiri explores the power and potential of representation while conveying her ever-changing perception of home. Amiri holds an MFA from Yale University where she graduated in 2020 from the painting and uh, printmaking department. She received her BFA from INSCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and was a Canadian Fulbright and postgraduate fellow at Yale University School of Art and Sciences from 2015 to 16. Her recent exhibitions include Quiet Resistance at the Munchhaus Museum in Germany, Rumi at Aga Khan Museum, Toronto, Sharjah Biennial 15, Thinking Historically in the Present, and so much more. <laughs> um, Amy Smith Stewart is chief curator at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and the founder of the eponymous pneumatic curatorial project, previously located on the Lower East Side. She was formerly a curator at MoMA PS1, a curatorial advisor for the Mary Boone Gallery, and the 2006 to 08 guest curator for the Peter Norton Collection. She has curated more than 60 exhibitions in museums and galleries. Recently curated exhibitions at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum include 52 Artists, A Feminist Milestone, Raven Half Moon, Flags of Our Mothers, and Siobhan Thomas, The Cavernous, to name just a few. Other notable exhibitions include Civic Action at Socrates Gallery, Remember Who You Are at the Mary Boone Gallery, and Greater New York 2005 at MoMA PS1. So I think we'll go ahead and get our conversation started. Um, thank you so much, Hangama and Amy, for being here tonight. And it's, it's been such a pleasure to work with you and the collaboration of opening this show. Um, just to get our conversation kicked off, I was wondering if I could pose a question to both of you, which is just about how A Homage to Home came together, how it started. Can you give us the origin story and both of your perspectives in making it? Absolutely. Before we start, though, I really want to thank everyone that's here tonight, but especially the Kemper for hosting this exhibition. It has been so easy and so much fun to work with Krista on bringing it here. And it's also a dream for Hangama and I to see this exhibition have another life at another institution. Um, as you can see from the images on the screen, the Aldridge is a very different architecture. <laughs> um, and the exhibition spanned three galleries on our first floor. So it's really exciting to be able to see it come to life in an entirely different space. But thank you to everyone at the Kemper and especially to you, Krista. Um, do you want me to start with the origin? Okay, so um, during the pandemic around 2021, um, Hangama had an exhibition in Chelsea at a gallery called Albert's Benda. And the exhibition um, spanned also a series of rooms there, but it was entirely immersive. I had a year or two before that been in Istanbul and been in the bazaars there. And so it was a multi-sensorial experience. Um, and I was really enamored with the way that um, Hangama altered the space, it was very oceanic. Um, the work spanned two-dimensional two to three-dimensional and were hanging from the walls and on the floor. So it was an extremely immersive experience. But the imagery is what really captivated me um, and, the, and the process. I'm really interested in artists who um, combine their autobiography or their biographical story with their choices of materials and methods and concerns. That's something I'm, I really am in, intrigued by and I think that's because I'm really interested in feminist art practices and a lot of feminist artists did that in their work. Um, and the storytelling in the work, um, and I didn't really know when I saw the exhibition, her background or her story. Um, so I went to her studio in New Haven, Connecticut and you know, sometimes as curators, it, um, we see it, we meet with an artist, and maybe the exhibition doesn't happen for several years, or ten years, or twenty years. But I was so enamored of the work and of Hangama, and then hearing her life story, um, so moved by the fact that her work also spotlights women and the collective struggle of women um, all over the world, and women in Afghanistan, and. Um, and also just the way that she was also using beauty. Um, and of course, under the Taliban, um, there are certain bright colors, uh, uh, shiny fabrics, nail polish, and makeup. These are things that are banned and outlawed, and the way that she incorporated this and really weaponized or instrumentalized beauty as an agent or a tool of resistance. Um, and I, uh, you know, we ended up 
you know, doing an exhibition where actually um, almost 14 of the work, almost the, a large proportion of the work is actually was made for the exhibition and then we borrowed four key pieces. There's 14 um, textile works in the exhibition, um, then four pieces we borrowed that were made over the past three years as a way of um, kind of bringing in, especially the bazaar, which you'll see this monumental piece that was very significant to the exhibition that had only been seen, only shown in Rome, had never been seen in the US, and then also a new neon sculpture. And um, so it was, it was an exciting opportunity. And because we had these three galleries, it really focused on um, a view, a vantage point of Afghanistan from post-war to present day. So experiences of her, you know, her mother's history living in Kabul, her memories of her homeland, but also her life as a refugee in Central Asia, and then her diasporic experience in um, Canada and the U.S. So um, we really, the ex Hangama really wanted to focus on both the private and public spaces of Afghanistan women. Um, of course, both pre before the Taliban, during the, when the U.S. were there, and then when the Taliban regained control. And the timeliness of the exhibition, because while we were working on the show, the U.S. left and the Taliban regained power. Um, so it was just, it's just, I'm gonna let you talk because I've said so much. <laughs> I mean, you guys have done really beautiful, beautiful introduction, thank you. Um, before, you good? Uh, well, before I start, we'll talk about this show particularly. I also wanna thank you, the Kemper Museum, their staff members, and especially the production you know, designer that really built up beautiful, beautiful show in this architecture, which I see it a very challenging space to work with, to be honest. Um, so I do wanna say thank to Samantha, Darby, well, uh, Molly, and a few others in the team, including Krista, who was beside us since the, Monday, I think, since Monday when I arrived here. So it has been a great, great collaboration, to be honest, to be among all of you. And just a very vibrant community you guys have as well. So I'm really happy to be among you here. Um, uh, of course, I'm nervous a little bit. They say when you're nervous, it means that you care a lot. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really good sign for me here. Um, all I can say that um, my bringing this exhibition all together, as Amy mentioned. It was um, in a very um, a specific political time, uh, what was happening in Afghanistan, and also how the politics or two sort of situations were affecting my studio practice in some way. And uh, when Amy met me and had a studio visit and then she offered me a solo exhibition, uh, or my first solo museum exhibition, so the invitation was very grand to me, but at the same time, I thought it would be really interesting to gather all the works that I have done since graduating Yale that was very much particularly focused on the issues of women's experiences in Afghanistan and their contemporary voices in the, um, not only in the, in the East Asian sort of steady spectrum, but also seeing it uh, through the diasporic you know, point of view as well. So I was really interested to how can I give testimony for those uh, specifically women that have and their voices has been censored, have been removed, um, or their access or their mobility and accessibility have been removed from public. So again, the proposal was bigger than my, I mean than myself, but at the same time I had a lot to gather and collect. So homage to home is um, sort of a testimony again to the land that I have left a very long time ago, but has never been left through myself or through my heart, I would say. Uh, wherever I have lived uh, as an artist or as a human, I've always thought or you know, think about Kabul uh, and, and think about my aunts, my cousins, my family that are still living in Afghanistan. So their stories have really lingered, lingered? lingered along through uh, who I am and who I am as an artist today. So I thought it would be really interesting to bring um, not only my past experiences leaving Afghanistan, but also the current and also question on the future 
uh, what will happen next. You will see some pieces um, of the fifth, I mean, the first piece that you guys will in be introduced is, is called recess. And recess really um, brings uh, more attention on the ban education that happened in 2021. Uh, and this was right in the same moment that I was creating other works and such events were happening um, in my year. So I thought it was really interested and important to bring these voices and this sort of imagery in the work. And uh, beside that, there's uh, the next room that you guys will see, um, a new baby born girls, I think. Newborn baby girls. Newborn, see? Newborn <laughs> baby girls. And that piece also reflects in the ideas of like the future of uh, the new generation of how they will be shaped by uh, when, when such rights and sort of accessibility are, are, are being removed from them. So this exhibition is a hopeful voice, but also it celebrates Afghan women's voices, Afghan women's representation, not only in the public, but also in the private lives as well. And it is a very dear exhibition to me, for me as well. And I hope you guys will also enjoy and see the faces of these small histories that I have touched upon uh, through working with fabric as well. So. <laughs> That was an amazing response. Thank you so much, Hankam and Amy, for indulging that question um, and for sort of setting the scene about what people are about to experience as they enter the exhibition. Um, and I think as people wander through the galleries, they're probably going to wonder about your material process. So I think we should shift from the content to the creative process, the physical process. Your works are so incredibly layered with many different techniques, um, so could you I guess indulge us again and tell us a little bit more about how you make the works, what the process looks like. A little painful, but, <laughs> but it's really enjoyable to be honest. Um, I, I do start every work that you see in this uh, exhibition from drawing. So drawing, gouache, and paint as my foundation material through my ideas first. And then from there, I, I transform these small drawings into brown paper and these brown paper are literally collected from Home Depot because <laughs> it's uh, the cheapest material I could afford and find. And that really shows me the scale of the work. So from that stage then, I use this technique. I'm sure if there's any textile artists in the audience, they might know this, um, uh, the fabric applique. I use this quilting technique, fabric applique, that is uh, assembling each shapes from the drawing, cutting and assembling fabric, and then putting them all together. With, uh, with using pens. So Amy knows the process because she saw uh, a peak um, how these are being built. And from there, then I take them to the sewing machine. And sometimes when the work is really in a larger scale and I wanted to edit them, I have to revisit, cut it through, put more materials at it, and then sew it again. So there's a beautiful um, uh, sort of process of uh, subtracting, adding, uh, through this fabric, even though it's not painting, but it has a lot of um, this uh, immediacy of cut, cut and collage. There's, there's a lot of that happening, which really makes sense in a way that, um, I have to say that um, I was a painter before being introduced to fabric, and when I make fabric, I do see them as a painting, um, because I am very much drawn to the language of painting still. The way I build these layers of fabric together as if I am building like with the you know, thin brush strokes of oil paint on canvas. So it's, it's, it's interesting, it's really interesting how these uh, fabric pieces also kind of challenges the hierarchy for myself, I think. And, um, and yeah, this is just the process and I can stop here, yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting too because you're uh, collaging with color so that it is very much associated with your earlier relationship with painting but also with textiles which is something you discovered when you were in graduate school you know there's a lot of frayed edges and so I think it's really a beautiful metaphor for fragments of memories of the past and memories of your home and um, and then kind of repairing you know 
with sewing, it's a suitoring or repairing, so there's a lot of care in that and collectively bringing all those stories together. And you'll notice that the works are, some of them are tremendously large. Mm -hmm. They're, um, the larger pieces are done in pieces, and Hangama was telling me when I went to her studio, because it's a very physical process, that really the pieces are as large as her arm span because she has to be she has to be able to work with them in her studio. Um, you have sometimes one assistant who helps you with the sewing, but it's not just machine sewing. She goes in by hand and does a lot of work. Also, um, there's a lot of embroidery in a lot of the work. Um, you'll notice in some of the hanging pieces, which she calls banners, which look like they impersonate advertisements. The, she embroiders a lot of the eyes and the women's faces and the eyelashes. Um, and also sometimes paints and draws on the surfaces. So, there, so this is a combination of many different processes in that work um, and the way that you approach it that is related to printmaking and painting. Um, so it's a really, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very intensive and laborious. Um, um, and there's a lot of uh, labor in them. And it was your mom who taught you how to sew, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, if we, yeah, that's a really uh, like very good point that you brought me here. Um, learning how to dress uh, the running a stitch, I only know that how to do it from my mom, how to put you know buttons on the pants or shirts. So very simple thing. But I do go back. I really do go back and the question of like what is the what is my um, aesthetic foundation, and I think uh, when I really look back into my childhood uh, landscape or you know childhood grown-ups, I didn't grow up um, having colors and brushes and I didn't have galleries or art books to really have that access through for the knowledge of art. The only materials that I have access was these fabrics and uh, cloths, and uh, we were also poor, like nothing. <laughs> so that was my first sort of um, introduction to craft making, to something to build with my hands. And we would gather these pieces of cloths and we would make little dolls of, out of two sticks, like crazy things, but they were really beautiful. That, that's my grown up, so that is my foundation of aesthetic. And that also reflects back uh, when I use in my work, I mean, you guys will see, there's a lot of images of the pop culture. There's uh, the pop culture also is a language that I am really drawn to because it also opens this generational conversation. Not only I would understand, but I'm also thinking about my mom era or my aunt's era back in the 80s or late 90s, how Kabul used to be and what sort of entertainment and artists and uh, female voices were really loud back then as well. So you will see postcards, uh, like Bollywood postcards, and also um, there's the covers from Jivandun magazine. Um, Jivandun is in Pashto word, and it also means life magazine that we had in America and other you know, Western cultures and Western countries. So Kabul also used to produce this uh, magazine back uh, from 1949 till 69. I, I think. think even into the, in into the late 90s. Yeah. yeah, into the early 90s. Late 90s. So these magazines will definitely like promote uh, progressive things that were happening around women's mobility and their access, both politically, I mean, both in the politics, society, and also um, historically. So loud voices, and it's really beautiful. So I do use those images in my work as well to reflect back. And one of the images in the salon, you guys will see it by the neon piece. Um, her name is Hangama, actual Hangama. So I see it as a signature piece because my grandma also named me after this pop star. Uh, she's <laughs> super famous. She's still alive. I'm sure she is, uh, you know, continues her artistry in the West, um, somewhere in Florida, I would say, but maybe I would be wrong. Um, amazing singer, amazing persona. So when I see her image, when I find these through these archives, this kind of reflects back uh, to my mom's uh, era, and that brings a conversation. So I am interested using history as a, as a vein to also connect this generational conversation. 
Because again, quilting, our fabric is about passing on the stories, right? We know that history very rich. Um, way, way, way back, uh, we, we wore quilts to be warm under it. We are all wearing fabrics as well, so it's definitely attached to our body and that carries a lot of memory, time, and history. So thank you for that loop. <laughs> it brought me a lot of memories this week. I know, and I think also, I think we should talk about to the the sources for the fabrics that you and textiles that you use because they're very specific, um, coming from the Afghan diaspora in New York City's fashion district and um, online outlets that are Central and South Asian textiles. The the fabrics have ge geographical meaning. Um, and also inc you incorporate fabrics given to you by friends and family. I, I get lucky. Um, <laughs> when that happens, uh, I guess, I, I'm so happy when that happens actually. Fabrics, textiles is not really uh, cheap material, um, I must say. And um, specific textiles that I collect even online, they come from hands to hands from, you know. Uh, you will see a few pieces actually in a plinth in this, mu in this show that is, um, there are specific fabrics that I found through Etsy. Uh, Etsy? Etsy. Etsy, right, we all know that. I mean, you can find anything there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, but it was a great search. Uh, so I sat like a month to really search like these fabrics that have been also migrated. Yeah. You know, these are fabrics that in intricate embroidery, different techniques of embroidery from different regions in Afghanistan. So for me, searching and archiving and finding these materials was also a way to educate myself, to really go back to what do I have that I have lost and that I have, haven't been taught in the institution around my career. So it was also revisiting that um, space of how fabrics were uh, part of this invisible labor that a lot of women uses and used as a hobby, as a something that they could stitch in their comfort spaces, like homes. But they're beautiful, and for me, I thought it would be really interesting to critique and bring it, what is a museum again, and how can I um, see an importance and give them value, again, the testimony. These intricate, anonymous artists who worked, yeah. and what is the invisible labor again? Women's invisible labor um, in the institution as a whole as well. Um, so yeah, fabric, yeah, I, I do source from online. Um, I also source people who bring it, and New York Fashion District, for sure. And sometimes when I don't have a specific patterns, I also use technology such as uh, printing on chiffon. So the piece um, in this first room, uh, her bed, my, that's a portrait of my mother, actually. And she had a beautiful Dove bed, and it was like rose petals. And I was like, how am I going to find a rose petal? <laughs> but so I decided to find the imagery and print them on chiffon. And beneath that chiffon is a lot of different velvet and colors and different textures that creates that shimmer um, surface. So there's that process as well. So if I don't find the textile, I print them. So there's that process of finding again, learning again, and yeah, putting it into work. Speaking of material, um, there is a neon piece in the work that I would love for you to talk about. Was this your first experience working in neon? Can you, can you share with us? This was my second one, yeah. The first one that I did was at my first solo exhibition at T293. It was in Rome. And uh, the addition of neon piece was interesting because it, is, it does reflect my um, recent visits back to Kabul, Afghanistan in 2010 and 2012. Not recent, but surely recent. And uh, for me, it was exciting because it was for the first time I saw Kabul at night. There's something very, a vibrancy there. I felt like it was New York, the Times Square, to be honest. If you see Kabul at night, I mean, you drive around buildings, uh, wedding halls, bazaars, they all have neon lights. And that kind of signified that like the city is still alive and people are still working night and day. And the neon light is basically the light that they could see each other. You know, it's a little moon beneath the streets, let's say. Um, it, it, it really gives that like time. 
So for me, it was interesting to bring that addition in what is a Bazaar again? Bazaar could also act 24 hour. And Bazaar is a public space that community come together, whether, whatever time of the day it is, right? And, um, and that specific symbol, if you guys will see it, it, it reflects um, their two hands, uh, kind of uh, in a very, f um, how to say it, in a very poetic gesture. They are holding each other, or they are like um, laying down. But then there's grapes. Um, their nail polish is also uh, green, I think. So on the other wall, uh, where the salon is, the title Shahr uh, Oruz, the city of bright. So the neon light was also kind of reflected from that title. It's in Afghanistan, um, uh, when the newly bright um, decorates themselves or you know, um, makes themselves beautified, uh, there's a certain grape that we call them, or we call after um, bright snail. So they call them Nohunake Orus, so the bright snail. So that's what I was really, kind of trying to find these mimic and semiotics and, and symbol, but also celebrate them, you know. So that is part of the title of that salon piece. Uh, so they all act, but they're fragments and they're a little bit, you know, separate from each other. As you curated really well, and I'm so happy that how you saw my work, or how you envisioned the works in this space too. So. Amy, did you have a thought? I, I have a few, but I just wanted to give you room to reflect. I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm getting, I walk through the exhibition and I keep going back to this idea of what Hungawan was talking about with the bazaar and having it be this kind of immersive experience and really the bazaar for you with the, the colors of the fabrics. And um, I know when you were a child in Kabul, your uncle had a tailor shop there and you spent a lot of time there. Um, but just that, also that space, um, like Hangama was saying, was once very active. Um, and um, for women now, um, they, can't, they have to be accompanied by men. And when Hangama went back in 2010 and 2012, women actually had a real strong presence in the bazaars. They had opened up um, shops and stores, um, especially services for women. So nail salons um, were very popular. Um, and you know, at, in 2021, all of that disappeared. And a lot of the imagery and posters of women's faces and advertisement for beauty products were all defaced and only the text remained. And so I think that um, when we look at it, um, we might not understand the defiance in, in, in Hangama's work. Um, and when, I, when she told me also that, which I never think about, that women are not allowed to wear shiny fabrics or colorful fabrics um, because of the fact that they make noise and they shimmer. And um, so these kinds of things, we might see them as colorful and vibrant and look at them formally as beautiful, but actually um, they really are a form of resisting, um, of resistance. And um, with the neon piece, I think that also speaks to the fact that women can't be out, out at night alone. Um, so there's a lot there that, um, especially with a lot of these pieces that you can see here um, that deal with the public spaces, um, you'll notice that there's a lack of, you don't see the women in these spaces. You see um, their presence is there through certain signifiers, um, the Bollywood postcards, the, the um, magazine covers, um, but the spaces are now unoccupied and empty because so many of them have shuttered. So I see all of these different layers in the choices, um, you know, the choice of bright light, bright colors, um, shimmery, transparency, um, transparencies, colors that if they could, would make noise that are very loud. Absolutely, and I think fabric does that. I mean, when I use uh, velvet, it really subdues sound for me. And when I use shiny, like polyester, which is so cheap material sometimes, <laughs> and they literally reflect light. It's like they are kind of oil painting to me, and I really love that. And yes, uh, you are right, they, they do act as a, um, as a form of resistance because um, 
Yes, I do remember um, beginning of, uh, you know, when the Taliban kind of slowly were taking over. I was seven years old, I do have vivid memories of uh, my mom and my aunts. They were really <coughs> beautiful women. They were always, you know, like tailored, uh, you know, their dresses, all that. But slowly, I wouldn't see them wearing those colorful fabrics or even decorating themselves and somehow you know, the veil become um, the shield. And it's like invisibility were happening all around. So for me, when I come back in a studio and I use these fabrics, it's, it is like to fight back. And uh, it's really powerful that how a fragile material could do that. And um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's a tactile material, and but it stretches so far, so far, yeah. And that's really exciting about this material that I'm, I'm in love, I guess. <laughs> I can talk more here, but sure. Um, I guess I, I sort of wanted to circle back to this idea of labor um, and sort of touching on that and economies too. So you reference a lot of material culture in your work, Kangama, and walking through the galleries, people will see um, references to foods or products that are only available maybe um, in Afghanistan, but sort of easily circulate between borders. Um, and it makes you think about often how difficult the process is to get citizenship or move for refugees or to have People, people physically move um, between borders. Could you, would you like to touch on that a little bit? Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there are some floor objects uh, that reflect food and these uh, specific cultural material uh, that I grew up with, like the basmati rice, let's say, um, or the dry fruits. Uh, they do, yeah, they are like anecdotes. I think we were talking about that last night that they are these anecdotes from the diaspora community, as Amy mentions this. Um, and they are kind of, uh, for me, they're a way of um, um, remembering, for me of like um, uh, uh, preserving that what does a diaspora mean and how can I create a diasporic experiences through going back these familiar objects that I would find in my hometown in New Haven or in New York City. So it is interesting that how we do live in a very post-globalized society, like one cannot have to live there in order to, experience, in order to experience Afghanistan, but sometimes you will find these things just next door. And for me, that, that was really interesting to kind of um, bring a little bit self-biographical, like who I am as an artist in this exhibition as well, and what is a diasporic experience as too. And of course, um, if we are critiquing the uh, the ideas of migration, there's, in this post-global world, products move faster than the body. Yeah. And, um, and so for me, if I am seeing these products, that also kind of um, brings me closer to what was Afghanistan or how was my childhood uh, memory grown, you know, like growing up. And these are just the remembrance sort of belonging and familiarity touch when I do make these objects. And of course, I'm also uh, um, inspired by Klaus Oldenburg. I'm sure you guys have a beautiful sculpture here, the handkerchiefs, and I've seen a lot around here. Um, so it's, it's quite exciting because he was also a source of inspiration for me because he also took the everyday um, object uh, through the pop culture lens and brought them into kind of massive body and they took a space. And it's all about taking a space. And these are banal objects at the same time. But once you expand them through fabric, because you also use fabric and leather. Yeah. Um, so that was one of my source of inspiration to look and see what other contemporary artists have done through their <coughs> daily object, through their everyday object that they grew up and that Americans are familiarized with. So for me, I'm also doing an act to make a space for the diaspora communities an institution like this, so that they could also feel a form of familiarity, a form of a home. Yeah. Thank you. And Amy, do you have any reflections before I ask another question? I mean, I, I was talking to, and I worked with another artist who was, um, she's Dominican New Yorker, and she was also very inspired by um, Klaus Aldenberg and but venerating her own Dominican heritage and making these large shopping bags with her grandmother's recipe of rice and beans. And 
she said the most amazing thing to me. Um, you know, I love when Dominicans see my work because they have special access. It's almost like a secret in my work. And I think that that's, that's something that is so generous um, about the way that you work that um, we had um, in New Haven, there's a large Afghan refugee population. Um, there's a large Afghan diaspora and they came to the museum and it was very special to them as well because it really was, a, as a collective, they could experience this together and there was a lot of references that were very meaningful and actually um, you'll notice that Hangama uses a lot of Farsi in her work and they were reading a lot of the text and so there's this, you know, I think that um, that's, what's so, that's what's so magnificent about contemporary art is that I feel like it builds empathy and it also builds connections across communities, across geographies, um, across time and circumstance. And um, in a way, it's critical actually, I think for us to deeply understand um, who we are, but who, who we live among. And um, I think that I almost come, come to tears when I hear Hangama's story and the fact that she spent nine years apart from her father. Her mother um, had four children that she was um, bringing through Central Asia on her own um, through Pakistan and Tajikistan for eight or, I think, seven or eight years before finally her application was granted by Canada. And then they, they get you, you're placed in Halifax, Nova Scotia, so not in Toronto. <laughs> in which happened you know to be to have actually a lot of a lot of intersecting diasporas um people f um from syria and i remember you told me lebanon and pakistan and um but to be able to from you know forced exile to force assimilation and to immediately be play, put in a large public school in Halifax and immediately be identified as an artist by an art teacher there who helped Hangama apply to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and then receive a Fulbright, Canadian Fulbright, to go to Yale and then get her MFA from Yale. To me and then to be here, I think it's just remarkable. That was so beautifully said, Amy. Thank you. I think, I think we can conclude the talk part part of this uh, program and move into questions and answers Q and A. So, um, if anyone has questions for Hangama or Amy or even myself, just raise your hand, and then our amazing my amazing colleague Louise Forster will come to you with the mic. All right, I see one back here, so I'm coming this way. And um, if you could please speak your question into the mic, that would be great as we're recording this portion of the talk. Hi, thank you so much for bringing your work here. Um, I know that you said you learned how to stitch from your mother. I know that you also said there's um, a lot of resistance and rebellion in your work using colors. Is there someone from your family or your lineage that you kind of um, got that rebellion from? Is that something you feel like you were born with or is that something that was cultivated um, through your work? I think I'll give full credit to my mom. <laughs> my mom is the role model, to be honest. Um, I think when Amy mentioned, um, I did live uh, away from my father, so I think uh, my mom was the person who really took care of us and uh, she did everything on her own, especially considering the context, like Central Asian countries, that still women are not so much visible in the work environment, right? So a single mom basically separated because of the migration, and, um, and wherever she would go, she would take us, and whatever formal um, spaces that she had was also among other women. So me hanging around with her girlfriends <laughs> or cousins or neighbors, which were also famous, this really was a very strong community on its own. And that's why I find, uh, and today in my work, there is like a, 
um, major voice and a major sort of a space that I create for women voices or contemporary voices. This is because of those, uh, you know, growing up with my mom and just being surrounded by her, um, you know, community. Yeah. So she is the, the stubborn and very hardcore, <laughs> I would say. So, but but that's just between me and her. <laughs> She's not easy, but she is definitely is a role model for sure. <laughs> Thank you, that was a beautiful question. Thank you. Next question, anyone else have a question? Um, since you've been gone from Afghanistan, but you mentioned in this conversation that you still had relatives there, correct? So have you, I have no idea whether you can have any communications with Afghanistan at this point at all, but have you had some conversations in knowing uh, for them what they are experiencing versus what we dreadfully see in the news? Um, thank you for the question. I am, um, I would say WhatsApp <laughs> is the way to go. Uh, WhatsApp is the, one of the online platforms that a lot of immigrants do use them, and uh, I am in touch through that. We do have video calls with my cousins and all, uh, but it's really saddening because uh, I have a lot of female cousins, and uh, they used to work and teach, and kind of uh, work position in higher places, like in both in politics and educational schools. Uh, but unfortunately, since this, um, when the Taliban came again and they took over, um, First of all, the women's education, the ban on women's education was a really hard, a very, very atrocious reality, I would say, to face again. And uh, my cousins, uh, majority of my cousins are homeschooling uh, their younger sisters, or their children even, which they are uh, married, majority of them are married. And they're outside of the job, unfortunately. So there's this um, domestic space become, they are also work space as well, in some way. And which is really sad, which is really sad. Um, this is thus far, I am informed with my own cousins. But sometimes I also hold uh, back to question them a lot. Because it's just, um, to be really honest, um, when they see you in the West, and uh, there's huge gap, right? And I also don't want to make them in that vulnerable position, so I always, there, so there's an immigrant tactic, they say that, however, how, however we are far from each other, we also want to send the message that we are okay, we are doing good. And uh, that's why whenever I am in contact with them, they always show their best, you know. And that's a very vulnerable position to be, to be honest. So uh, I am in touch, I am in touch, of course I am. I was wondering, because um, I feel like every single artist has a different answer to this, but do you feel that artists have a responsibility to make work that is about resistance and, and revolution and, and you know pushing back against the wrongs that we see in the world? Or do you, is it somewhere in the middle, or do you think it's something that like it, art can just be beauty for, for beauty's sake? I, like In your art, I think I see a lot of your feelings of resistance and, and wanting the world to change, but I think that every person also feels differently about whether or not artists have an actual responsibility to do that. Mm, that's, a, that's a really important question, I would say. I think um, for me, I've always been really interested to, um, because I grew up and I saw something was not perfect or something was wrong. <laughs> And that was what was happening to my mom and my aunt. So it's a very personal take. It's a very personal politics, if you can take that road. And um, I don't know if I can speak for all artists. You know, every artist have their own ways of expression, their, their own ways of making history. And for me, my history is to make as much as platform and a space for these unheard voices, um, whether they're personal, experiences or whether they speak at large. So I do believe in those resistant forms. It just depends of how 
how artists uh, use their tools to express those, um, I would say. So I don't think I can speak for all artists, but I do believe um, at such times it is important to voice in whichever tools or form you're comfortable uh, or that you are able to, you know. So yes, art definitely has, it's one of the strongest tools, I would say, in entire uh, everyday life. Yeah, we are the changers. <laughs> Thank you.